my name is Seb Sontag, and I'm very excited to introduce you today to Rene Amador. He's a co-founder and CEO of AR Wall. He's going to do a presentation about the virtual production crash course for indie, indie filmmakers. Rene, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Seb. Uh, so yeah, this is virtual production crash course for indie filmmakers. This is specific, specifically for those of you uh, who want to know how is this relevant for my specific project, what are the expectations, who's doing this, uh, where is this available, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, also give you uh, some good resources at the end so that you can continue afterwards. Um, but just to give you a little bit information uh, about myself, I'm going to click in here. All right, so uh, we'll start with a background about myself. This is going to be about uh, 30 minutes uh, on crash course topics, and then we'll be followed by a QA. and a um, So uh, going through here, there's going to be two shameless plugs. One of them is going to be when I'm talking about uh, my work as a virtual production supervisor. And at the end, after uh, the resources, uh, I'll give you guys a little graduation ceremony and uh, for doing the crash course and a gift, uh, which will be the second shameless plug. So that'll be the limit of the shameless plugs. If you're wondering, what's this guy getting out of this? Uh, that's what I'm getting out of it. All right, let's get, let's get started here. Um, so my background, I started working in startups at age 10. Uh, I'm one of those uh, kids of an entrepreneur who decided to uh, go into the same industry, uh, which was tech. And uh, since worked at 16 startups, including four, I co-founded. So four, AR Wall is my fourth uh, go at this. Uh, it's definitely the most successful. Prior to this, uh, I was a commercial director. Um, I ran a creative uh, commercial production company where I directed 350 commercial short films and pilots. So not only do I have a background in technology, but I've also got a really strong background in content creation as a director, as a visual effects uh, supervisor, uh, and someone who's worried about budget and creative and all that kind of good stuff that you, I'm sure you guys are worried about as well when it comes to virtual production. Uh, just a little uh, tidbit about myself. My first viral hit was in 2002. That was in high school where I made that, and that was called Real Ultimate Power, the official ninja movie, which I self-distributed on my own website that was based off of realultimatepower.net, which is a popular ninja-based themed website, humor website at the time. Uh, and I've continued doing uh, that type of stuff throughout my career, combining digital uh, and creative in interesting uh, ways. AR Wall is in that tradition uh, of uh, uh, finding, just trying to find bridges between creative and technology. Uh, beginning in 2016 at AR Wall, uh, we began pioneering LED XR backdrops. A lot of this conversation is going to be um, about XR backdrops because I'm sure that's where a lot of people are interested in. They're kind of, you know, they know the chroma key game and they want to know what's this new LED XR backdrop uh, stuff. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about. I've done over 50 deployments uh, of that type of stuff uh, and uh, 3,500 plus hands-on demos. Uh, to pretty much everyone you can imagine. I also uh, own two patents on uh, XR backdrops. Um, my prior company, if you're interested, it's called Automaton Creative. Uh, and then here at ARWell, well, we've got two products, ARFX, ARFX Home Studio, uh, which I'll be talking about a little bit. Um, this is why you should listen to me. This is ARR Walls Traction, the, the, my company that I'm the CEO of and that I co-founded. We've worked with pretty much every, um, every studio. There are actually more studios on here that we're currently working with that didn't make uh, this list. Uh, so sorry to those, uh, those guys. Um, as far as what we do at AR Wall, uh, just so you can understand kind of like, like what, what this is all about and like what our piece of it is. Um, so we're one of the technology providers in this space. Our partners are, you know, like Unreal Engine and uh, open source systems like uh, OpenXR. And then we also work directly with like NVIDIA and all these guys. Uh, if you look at this uh, chart here on the on the left, you'll see like uh, that red circle is kind of where where we do our proprietary work and our and our patented work. And then we also wrap up this entire system in that in that second red box uh, and actually sell that as an all in one solution to give you an Idea, like what our software looks like there it is uh, right there at the bottom that's our air effects demo launcher and that's like gives you an idea of like what we're up to okay so now we will do our one and only uh video uh clip here we go uh, is it gonna allow me to full screen perhaps not okay so we're gonna watch <laughs> we're gonna watch a tiny version of this um So we really see ourselves in the tradition of uh, 
of rear projection, green screen, and everything like that, and now just a continuation of that type of uh, technology. So you see a lot of uh, stuff in there. Some of that is studio work. Some of it is independent work. Uh, we, we kind of uh, straddle both worlds. We're one of the few companies that does that. Um, so let's, let, I wanna uh, set the uh, playing field here. What is virtual production? Okay, so the, according to Google, it's a emerging method that uses a suite of software tools to combine live action footage, computer graphics in real time. Uh, filmmakers and contributors. Okay, so you get the picture here. It's technical, it's filmmaking, it's lots of interesting stuff. Now, you talk to an XR salesman, of course, of which I am uh, one. Of course, you're going to hear all sorts of uh, um, exaggeration and everything like that about, oh, this is, this is the second digital revolution, uh, everything like that. Uh, of course, these are all really true. Uh, my personal opinion is, at the end of the day, uh, it's using real-time tools to achieve a cinematic vision. Uh, that's that's basically all you need to know uh, from a filmmaking perspective. Uh, why real-time? Real-time is cheaper. I, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, four types of virtual production. So there's fully CG shots using real-time tools. That's traditionally what you would um, like kind of see on high end uh, Hollywood productions like The Lion King. I also want to point out Has Films' uh, upcoming project, Mutant Year Zero. He posts uh, a lot uh, behind the scenes about that specific project, the work he's doing on that. So if you're interested in knowing about fully CG stuff, we're not going to cover a lot of that in, in this course uh, uh, because it is a very specific uh, type of virtual production. But Has Films has posted a lot of that type of stuff, has to little the, the creator of that. Uh, then there's real-time chroma key, which you'll know of on like SNL, Weather Channel, the famous Oprah uh, Obama interview in which he was placed inside, you know, he was on green screen, placed inside her location, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then uh, in-camera LED uh, XR backdrops, that's what we do at AR1, what we're known for. And that's basically where you track the camera motion and then in the background, you have this uh, amazing depth illusion like you saw in that, in that video clip. Uh, where you saw the camera moving and then there's this crazy distortion happening on screen. Well, from the camera's perspective, that all looks like a beautiful window, you know, amazing for the real window illusion, you hope. And then uh, the new one uh, is definitely uh, something that's emerging. Uh, there's only a few people that have been playing with this and there's no name for it, so I call it Tri-Layer XR. And this is combining uh, screens and green screen and AR foreground elements all through lens emulation and interactive lighting, system sync. It's just a very technically complex process. And when a lot of filmmakers imagine virtual production as something that might exist in an ideal future, generally this is what they're thinking of, is what I would call tri-layer XR, which basically means you combine it all together and you, you know, you're doing it all at once and everything like that. Okay, let's see. All right, so let's start with real-time chroma key. This is the basic diagram that you're gonna be looking at um, uh, from a technical perspective, from a physical perspective. Uh, this is what it's gonna be. You're gonna have a, a tracker on the camera. You're gonna have a calibration tracker, which sits on the ground or near near the, uh, the green screen uh, volume. Uh, and then you're gonna have cables running to a system. And that system is gonna be running a real-time scene Generally, it's in real engine. Uh, here, we're showing off the Vive setup. That's where most people start because it's a very approachable uh, type of technology. But I want to be clear, we have a proprietary build, build of Vive, and Vive is an open source uh, technology. So you can get studio grid results at, out of that tech. All right, so um, that next, let's talk about uh, in-camera XR backdrops, the future of filmmaking. I wonder who came up with that phrase. Uh, seems like a very intelligent person. <laughs> um, okay, in camera XR backdrops with LE with LED. Um, so this is this is what it's going to look like in a comparison to to green screen. Um, it's it's somewhat simplified. You'll see here that there's slightly less cables uh, that are running uh, between the system. In fact, it can be entirely wireless. You've got a, again a tracker on uh, the camera. It can be wired if you want. If there's if you're getting uh, wireless interference, and then you've got a tracker that's near the screen. Um, and that is used to calibrate the system. And then, uh, you know, behind that, you've got the workstation again, again, running Unreal Engine. The, what is not shown here is sometimes you will need to genlock sync from the camera to a, a master sync. 
uh, both in green screen and in LED. In some situations, that is suggested. So you're going to want a, a sync generator, like one of the Blackmagic sync generators, and then you're going to want uh, SDI cables, which means that the camera has to be able to take SDI uh, and take ref in. So that's that's a consideration. Okay, so this is the case study um, that we released, uh, which which was very effective in convincing people. Um, this is the summary page. Uh, and this is something that we did for night flyers. I work on night flyers. And basically what you're looking at here is uh, it's a 62 to 73% cost savings. So this is something that's not just making sense from a, from a, like, a, ooh, it's cool technology standpoint, but it's actually saving money uh, for, for productions as well. All right, so for those of you who are screenshotting every slide, this is the, this definitely want to get this one. This is the slide you screenshot. This is um, what uh, uh, the basic investment to purchase, if you wanted to build your own stage, this is kind of the, the, the purchase uh, recommendations that we give to our own clients. And these are numbers that we actually deliver on, on these numbers. So these are real market uh, numbers that's something that you can't usually get so here you go guys this is part of the the secret sauce that was uh uh promised all right so this is the slide you screenshot part two uh this is to give you an example of what the different rental pricing so you're not you're not buying a screen or or a system you're actually uh renting it a, a space and a led screen uh, uh put to put together um, and uh, so this is this is definitely some of the recommendations that we give uh, uh, for filmmakers who want to understand like uh, what's my minimum budget going to be. Uh, so the recommended minimum budget is uh, definitely 25k uh, for for to get a good usage out of this type of technology. Um, uh, what's not included here in the uh, in the in the bundle day rates that you'll see for each of the three screen sizes is the cost to create a scene. Now, this is this is the big one. Uh, how much does it actually cost to create a beautiful scene? Well, the first thing you should know is if you can find the scene in, for free online, for example, in the Unreal Asset uh, Marketplace, then you're basically paying for the cost uh, of to purchase that screen, which is like, you know, uh, in most cases, it's under $50 or you're paying somebody to um, create the screen from the scene from scratch, or in some cases you're uh, purchasing the scene and then you're paying someone to make it or to modify and make it look beautiful the way that you want it to look. In those instances where an artist is involved, you're definitely gonna be looking at 5K, uh, this is US uh, dollars, just to be clear, uh, up to 40K for a single scene. The most complex scene that we've ever built out was in the 40K uh, range. And that was like a 360 degree city that you could kind of fly through and, and have like, you know, basically like a hundred different um, uh, uh, look, uh, little locations uh, in there uh, to, to, uh, to use. Um, so, uh, okay, so just to give you a little, some more specific anecdotes about what, uh, what these types of rentals look like, um, we in, uh, in Burbank, with, uh, in partnership with Soapbox Films at Soapbox Film Studios, we have about a 24 foot LED screen, the medium uh, that you see here. And this is, um, uh, it's about, yeah, it's about 24 uh, feet wide with by an 11 feet high. Um, the depth on that, just to, get, to give you a little bit of behind the scenes on that, it's, it's about four feet. There's a structure that's behind, the LED screens themselves are very thin. Like uh, like like three inches like that, uh, and then and then behind it is about four feet of uh, like I guess we call it uh, scaffolding or structure, and um, you, it needs to be built up. It takes a couple days, uh, as you see here in the last slide. Depending on this on the size of screen, it does take a, a longer to install. So there is something to keep in mind in those instances where you know like you've got you you're really only using it for one two days, you know that's going to change uh, uh, if you're purchasing, that's definitely going to change um, uh, when you want to do the load in and, uh, and you want to do it a few days ahead of time. Um, and then if you're getting a very large system, that's a, that's a large consideration. Five days would definitely be, um, uh, as you can see, the, the largest system here, 1.5 millimeter, 80 foot screen, uh, that's a five day install and that's generally uh, reality. Uh, it's going to take a five, full five days. Um, so that's uh, some of the consideration. If the screen isn't built up to the size that you're that you're using it at, then it will take time to build it up. It's anywhere from half a day to a full day minimum. Um, 
Okay, so in, in, in Burbank, uh, at our stage, you can have uh, this screen, the stage, it comes with the stage manager, uh, virtual production supervisor and artist, uh, all for 7,500 a day. That's a rate that we're seeing being reflected at other stages. And then when you bump up to kind of that 44 foot uh, level, it does tend to bump up a bunch, uh, uh, above 10K. You're looking at 10K as like a basement and then it's going up from there. Some people, they, they're willing to do bundles where they bundle in the creative and you, you know, you say, I'm going to be there for a week. They give you a, uh, a, a fee for the, for the rental of this, of the space. And then they'll bundle in the creative into that. Uh, you're going to be wanting to look for those types of deals because generally the, if you, if you try and hobble it together, you're going to end up in situations where um, the team that's creating the content doesn't necessarily know the deployment strategy that's necessary for that screen. And uh, if the if the if it's a stage using their own team, uh, that's going to be a good fit because they know how to be competitive on the market while still, uh, you know, um, but being able to provide good technical and creative uh, uh, oversight over that or that project. Okay. Um, so that's uh, more information on this one. If you just want to get started, it's definitely um, uh, kind of like a 14 foot screen. It's kind of the minimum that we've ever deployed. That was in somebody's home. They wanted to do, um, you know, instructional content. Uh, so it's 14 by eight foot screen that was working for them. It's important to keep in mind here that there is a minimum distance requirement from the screen to the camera. So if you if we go back here, you actually see the first number here, it's the it's 2.5 millimeter, then there's a set that's 1.5 millimeter. So that's referring to the pitch size in between the LED panels. So 1.5 millimeter pitch, it's a little bit confusing. 1.5 millimeter pitch means that there's one and a half millimeters between the LEDs. 2.5 millimeters means there's a larger gap between the pixels. So actually the, to get a tighter pixel density, you want a smaller number. So like 0.9 would be considered like a very, very tight, very uh, dense. And then uh, to give you a sense like the Mandalorian that was done on about 2.7, 2.8. Um, so that's become an industry standard somewhere between 2.6, 2.8. That's, uh, that's kind of the industry standard. And that's where most of you, will, if you're renting, we'll see those sizes being used in, in the stages. Um, we actually uh, have been really been liking 1.5 um, because it, it there's one of the big questions is how much space do you need between the screen and the camera? So here we give some information on that. Um, in addition to the minimum stage size, uh, uh, I can tell you that the minimum distance is going to be dependent on the pitch size. So you're going to take the pitch size and you're going to multiply it by 2,500. Uh, so something like um, uh, a 1.5 millimeter uh, screen, you will end up with uh, something like 3.75 meters. That's the minimum distance that your camera should be from the screen. Um, so you can see here, if you, if you have a tight pitch screen, you can get closer. And that could benefit you if you have a small space. But if you do have a large amount of space, lower, uh, higher pitch screens are cheaper to rent. However, you will need a larger screen because you'll have to push back from the screen uh, that much more. Just like um, I'm showing you here, basically the, the, this, is, this is an approximation of the recommended distance, which is about 15 feet uh, from a 1.5 millimeter uh, screen. And as the, as the, uh, pitch size um, goes up, you will then have to become more distant from the screen. So you can see there's a give and a take here. Um, uh, having a lower pitch screen requires a larger size, which may not actually end up saving you any money versus a smaller screen. So there's uh, considerations here, but for as far as the minimum stage size, this is what we're uh, recommending. Okay. So here is where a lot of the goodies are, a lot of the secret sauce. Um, so as far as crew, there's going to be four minimum crew um, that you're going to be bringing onto a project to help you achieve your vision. Uh, there's going to be a department head that's a virtual production supervisor. This is the most expensive person because this is the most experienced. Generally, this person is coming either from post-production supervision uh, or from a visual effects supervision, and they know how to you know, play the onset game and, and make sure that the team gets what it needs. Uh, then there's a virtual production producer or manager. 
um, who's kind of a tech and art hybrid, maybe can set up systems, physical systems. Um, this person's going to be a little bit uh, uh, cheaper, um, uh, but it's going to be a person that's more difficult to find because that technical art hybrid is just going to be a, a difficult uh, a find. So what we found is people who are coming from um, live events, um, they tend to be good at, at this role. Um, uh, because they have a, they, you know, live events tend to be cheap uh, or low, low budget events. So they're doing a lot of hands-on work themselves. They're setting up the cables, they're setting up the lighting, they know how to set up tracking uh, uh, technology or whatever the uh, LEDs in some cases the case may be. Uh, so that that's where the back, this type of person background uh, generally comes from. Then the CG art director is gonna kind of be, you know, kind of your artsy painter, maybe does some photography, there's a DPs on the side, but also does painting and illustration, somebody who thinks a lot about uh, lighting and color and probably also has a background in Unreal Engine. This person is going to be a little bit more um, uh, expensive because they're the head of the creative team. And then beneath them is going to be the real-time environment artists. These are background, have a background in 3D design or in Real Engine. Uh, and these, these generally are coming from a wide variety of places, from game design to visual effects, uh, to architectural visualization and everywhere uh, else uh, that you can imagine people come from, from Unreal Engine. Recently, there's also um, an Unreal Engine fellowship that has been pumping out about 50 people a month uh, that have a background in some of the virtual production tools inside Unreal Engine. You can see I'm saying Unreal Engine a lot and, and hopefully that gives you an idea. That's this, if you're interested in learning the software, that's the software that, um, that you're gonna wanna learn. And that's where a lot of the, that's where the playback happens uh, on set. That's where a lot of the creativity happens for lighting. Uh, so that's that. That's the team. It's going to be an Unreal Engine heavy team. But then this is also going to be a team that um, has a good onset attitude and 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 is is going to be cool under pressure in those moments where everything is going wrong and there is going to be high level troubleshooting happening. Uh, this is a this is a, a team that. Um, uh, uh, if, if you get it right, this is going to be uh, a very big help uh, to, to make sure that all the technical considerations are, are, uh, are done and are taken care of, just as you would expect on any production, any high level effects production. Okay, now some of the real, real nitty gritty tidbits. Um, use a global shutter camera to reduce uh, to reduce refresh artifacting. This is one of the biggest considerations when you're shooting um, on LEDs. Um, uh, this is also probably recommended if you're doing real-time chroma key um, as well. Uh, it's, to, it's to use a, it's not as it's not as critical, um, uh, but global shutter cameras are going to be a a good choice. Why is that? Because the when the LED screen is refreshing is refreshing the content on the screen. It has that, you know, it does that vertical thing, and the the just like you would expect, like on a traditional CRT monitor. It goes, it starts at the top, it goes row by row and it goes all the way down, right? And it does it like in chunks, like maybe 16 pixels, it'll you know do 16 pixels across. And in combination with a rolling shutter, you will end up sometimes getting uh, what look like artifacts that kind of like look like jaggy lines like that as you go up and down. It's usually only in the mid-tones of, of a scene but um, that could be dramatically reduced using a global shutter camera. It's something that we're dealing with on a, pro on a production right now. Um, uh, luckily, we were able to solve it. And that's part of you know, the magic that we're able to do, having done it many times before. But uh, for those instances where it's a tight schedule, global shutter is going to be recommended. Um, second, do a camera test on the screen and ask the rental house for a loaner. This is absolutely critical. Before you commit, before you sign uh, on the dotted line for a rental, you want to do a camera test. You want to bring the camera that you're going to shoot, use on the production. You want to ask the rental house for a loan. Hey, can, you know, beg them. Usually, if it's a if it's a you know a two day or more rental, they'll, they'll do it no problem. You know, otherwise you you have to find a, you know somebody who's going to like you know give you a break basically. Ask the rental house for a loaner. Bring it. Shoot it for a couple hours at the screen. Try different lenses. Try all the different types of things that you're going to do. Distance. You know everything. Because I guarantee you, in 50% in of scenarios, there's a mismatch that happens between the screen and the camera, and something needs to be dialed. 
either the screen needs to be dialed or the, or the camera needs to be dialed in any case you want to do a camera test. Then at least one day, uh, one day of tech rehearsal with that, that starts at least 48 hours prior to the shoot to allow for final creative tweaks. So this is going to be a, a tech rehearsal day where all these four people, as well as the director and the DP, and probably the gaffer as well, are going to be on set. They're going to be turning on lights. They're going to be checking for flicker between lights and screen. They're going to be uh, checking for reflectivity on uh, on different props and and uh, and uh, costumes and set pieces. And they're going to be doing everything that they're going to uh, do on the actual shoot day, except they're going to do it from tech rehearsal basis, as you as you guys probably know what that is. Um, then my some of my uh, recommendations are uh, here at the end. This is the the absolutely brand spanking new right from the front lines um, kind of suggestions that we definitely have. First one is move the camera in every shot and every take to help sell the illusion of death. Sometimes people get in front of an LED, LED screen or they get in front of a green screen uh, uh, volume and they, you know, they, they're still in that mentality of like, you know, let's run sticks, run sticks, run sticks. And it's, it's just not the right attitude for virtual production because not only not only are you free to move the camera, but it's actually going to help sell the illusion. Uh, so that's 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 a critical component uh, of this. Uh, and then this is this is this is the one that I personally we found that this helps on recent uh, productions. When you change the focal length, when you zoom in or when you zoom out on your shot, you want to move the camera or actor distance from the screen. Why is that? Because what ends up happening otherwise is you will have you will be in a situation where there's a where let's say you're you know you're 15 feet from from the screen and your actor is 10 feet from the screen, and the defocus from your lens to the screen looks a certain way in that shot, and then you change the focal length. What should be happening in physics is that the the bokeh property, the circle of confusion and the optical properties of that shot change as you zoom out or as you zoom in. And what ends up happening is people don't realize that that's happening and they end up baking in the same focal look as they're on their wides as on their close-ups. And that ends up, it's not something that you think about when you're looking through the viewfinder, but it's something that you think about as an audience member and an editorial because you're cutting from one type of bokeh to another type of bokeh and they look too similar because one's tight like this and the other one is wide, but the, the background looks the same distance on both shots. It looks like it has the same optical properties. And that's not the way that, that physics works. Not the, that's not the way that zoom lenses work. So what you want to do is when you're zooming in, you move the actor and the camera away from the screen so that you're getting a more severe bokeh and more severe defocus on the screen and that will help you in editorial cut from shot to shot and take to and, and angle to angle uh and help and and it's not one of those things that you think about on set but in editorial you go shoot and uh and so that's the that's the hot tip from the front lines guys all right sorry there's a lot of time on this page but you can see this is the this is the secret sauce all right so you passed you passed the crash course. We've got two minutes left here. Um, so these are some good resources. Like I mentioned, unrealengine.com. Uh, uh, you're going to want to go to the marketplace there. There's a lot of free scenes, natural scenes, uh, interiors, interiors, that type of stuff. If you want to take additional courses, Unreal Engine, uh, you know, they. I don't know what to say, guys. They got a, they got a corner on the market here. Unity is doing good stuff. And Uni there's some good stuff being done in Unity, which is the other real-time game engine that's out there, uh, which is the main competitor to Unreal. Um, but uh, all our work at, at AR Wall is on Unreal Engine right now. So if you're interested, if you're a filmmaker and you, and you want to do fully CG shots, you just want to dive in there and start playing around with it, go to the online courses. There's virtual production section uh, in there. So... Um, you know, that, that's where you guys should continue. Okay, so then this is the, the super secret deep, deep cut um, uh, information. If you're on Facebook, you want to join the Unreal Engine virtual production group. This is not one of those Facebook groups where, you know, you get, you get some salesmen in there and they're, you know, trying to hawk you, you know, you know some cheap thing. This is this, one of those places where it's 
um, actual people who are actually doing this stuff, professionals who are asking questions from other professionals, who are answering questions for newbies, uh, who are answering uh, software specific questions, hardware questions, tracker questions, business development questions. How do I make a business in the virtual production space? Um, how do I bring this to my region? Everything like that. This Facebook group is amazing. And it's the, it's no matter who you talk to, it's going to be the number one resource that anyone is going to use. We've been on set in situations where we thought we were going to lose the job. We go to the Unreal Engine virtual production group. We ask some questions. We search for some answers and then we find the solution uh, that, that, uh, that we need uh, to keep, to keep that gig and, uh, and be successful. Okay. So here's your graduation gift guys. Um, if you don't know anything about AR wall, we recently launched a product called ARFX Home Studio. Uh, so for those of you who are here and who graduated the crash course, congratulations. I've got a 10% off uh, uh, code for you. Just use Spark at checkout. Um, so why, why would you be interested in this? This Because everything that I just mentioned to you has been boiled down into a piece of software uh, that I helped design, uh, me and my, and my partners, uh, called ARFX Home Studio. It's an all-in-one patented solution, and it comes with uh, a 10 map starter pack. This is a $35,000 value that we're offering at a base price of 9,500. And this is really good if you're a creator at home, you just wanna get started in the XR uh, revolution. So this is uh, 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 just for those of you who are sticking around, let's see what we got here. Got 19 participants, okay. So it went, it went up from start. Thank you so much uh, for sticking around. Uh, so that's basically, that is um, that is the crash course in virtual production. As you can tell, very heavily leaning into XR. I have a, an actual XR bag. This is the screensaver for ARFX Home Studio. When you're not using it, this is what it'll, it'll be looking like. And as you can imagine, you know, we're creators ourselves. We like things to look pretty. And uh, we made this uh, amazing, beautiful Ferrari looking uh, box. And um, that's my uh, co-founder. Uh, Jocelyn, who's in the photos there, and uh, that's her like uh, pitching this uh, at, at some other event. Okay, back it up, back it up. All right, uh, thank you, Janelle. Janelle says this is a fantastic talk, so I'll I'll take it. Thank you. Oh, um, it was really awesome, really awesome. Thanks so much. Like also myself, I learned a lot. Yeah. So secret secret sauce recipe delivered. Now all of you can go and do this yourselves, you can say, wait a second, on Renee's talk, I saw that the stage should be somewhere in this vicinity of cost. And I am going to you know, negotiate and I'm gonna be empowered as a filmmaker to make this happen for my production. That's what all of you are, are now capable of. Um, so happy to answer questions. Let's see what questions are up. We have the Q&A where people can post and also obviously in our chat. Uh, to, get, to get it rolling, I, I'm just throwing in a couple of questions and, uh, and then hope to motivate some people. So if you're an indie filmmaker and you're like deciding to go with the LED and you know we've seen your rental prices, you told us that there's around one a day to 48 hours of prep time on mm -hmm. set let's say you're like also familiar with Unreal and you created your scene yourself because you want to save some, some time and money. How would you test in advance before renting out the LED wall that your Unreal Engine will run properly and not have too low of a frame rate or like you're running then into trouble, you spend all the money in the LED and then you're like, oh my God, I can't even have it working. Perfect. Um, so they used, it used to be a huge concern. You would turn on real-time ray tracing on a scene and your frame rate would drop to half. And then you realize, uh-oh, I've got to make compromises. I've got to figure out what's going on here. The, the machines that are on these sets, these are generally running um, NVIDIA RTX Quadros. Um, and uh, these, are, these, these machines are very uh, uh, capable of, of running like 90 frames, 120 frames per second for high-end video games. And for virtual production work, we're generally trying to pump out 24, 30, sometimes 60 in, in some cases. Um, uh, and we're, 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 you know, we're generally in sync to those frame rates. Um, so we have a lot of overhead on these cards. So you know, to be frank, if it's working on your home system and if, and if you're able to get this running at a good frame rate on your home system, it should be something that when you uh, show up on set, you're gonna, you're hopefully gonna have even more overhead. And if not, 
there is something new in a real engine called DLSS, which, okay, it stands for deep learning super sampling, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a way to, how do you split this? Cut down the actual rendered resolution, but not the apparent resolution. Meaning to the human eye, it'll still appear to be very, very high resolution. This is a, this is, we did experiments and we found that it increases the processor overhead by about 60% massive, just a massive increase, which, make, which makes real-time ray tracing now a possibility for every single scene, which is pretty exciting. Awesome, really awesome. Um, we have some questions coming in. Um, one is, will your slides be available after the talk? Um, if, uh, yeah, let's see here. Um, if it's, if you're interested, you can, uh, follow me on LinkedIn, uh, Renee Amador LinkedIn. And, uh, um, you, I will, I will post the, the information up there. Um, I, I, I believe this, this talk will also be recorded and available for people to view uh, afterwards. You can also do it that way. Perfect. And then you can screenshot if you, if you want to. Um, another question here is, for most independent producers seeking to hire crew for this kind of thing, um, what are the normal costs of the key crew positions you had mentioned? Okay. All right, Anonymous. Let's see here. For most independent producers, what are normal costs? Normal costs. Well, that's, that's difficult to answer because, of course, for diff every different region is going to have different expectations. Some, um, okay, here, this is the slide that they're referring to. Um, so the, these one, two, three, four here. These, um, this is gonna depend on every region. In some regions, there's a lot of game development people, you know, like um, uh, uh, in some cities in, in Canada, uh, for example, there's a lot of game development people and you're gonna be able to find uh, some of these roles more easily than maybe here in LA, where a lot of the people are coming from visual effects, when, when people are coming from visual effects, they're very territorial about the rate and, and you know, it's, it's that rate is only relevant for a portion of the actual days that they put into a project, right? Because they're doing unpaid work here and there. So they pad that rate real heavy. And then they come into virtual production and sometimes they don't understand that it's a different, it's a different type of um, labor market in virtual production because everything is done in pre-production and everything is during, done during production. And then as soon as they wrap, it's over. So you don't have a lot of that extraneous unpaid time that happens at the tail end that a lot of, of people get involved, get totally wrapped up in and caught up in. Um, so we found that in those instances where those people are a little bit more savvy, they bring their rates down and, they're, and it's a little bit uh, uh, more reasonable. Um, the producer and manager, I definitely would recommend bringing that, uh, that, per that person in from uh, a parallel industry, if possible, live events, um, uh, virtual events, that the person has been doing events in VR, uh, that type of stuff. It's a lot of similar types of uh, um, uh, considerations, uh, technical considerations, creative considerations, working with artists who are finicky and, and, and very, you know, have been uh, uh, mangled in the, in the machine of the of the creative industry, uh, but then also with highly technical engineering people, and that type of person is uh, like I mentioned. That's that hybrid that you really have to uh, find that that person. Um, as far as the absolute costs, um, what I can say for a real time environment artist to generate a scene, like I mentioned, it's going to be anywhere. It's going to be about five thousand uh, for a basic for a basic scene. And that will take them about two weeks, one to two weeks uh, to do that. So, you know, figure out the, figure out the day rate uh, from there. Uh, and that also ho hopefully gives you an idea of what the other people might uh, cost here as well. Uh, just, just to give you a sense for myself as a virtual production uh, supervisor, I generally take a salary. So I don't take a day rate on, on, a, on a production. I get hired in the beginning of a production like you would hire a... Um, a production designer, and then I'm involved throughout the entire process until wrap day. And I, so I take a, a, a single uh, salary rate for that. Hopefully that answers the question. <clears throat> that was awesome. Uh, next question here uh, for Marmoli. 
um, is the process of making real-time environments in Unreal Engine the same used for video games and architectural visualization, or is there a different workflow or set of optimization needed to run it as a virtual production environment? Perfect. So architectural visualizations are unique in that oftentimes um, uh, you're using pre pre-made elements, not not all the time. You're using it like like furniture, you know, pre-made furniture and everything, and materials and everything like because you need to pull from things that actually exist in the physical world, right? So um, sometimes people who work in architectural visualization end up leaning a lot on those realistic materials. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but for example, that person might not be so good at, for example, like creating like a uh, uh, like a laser beam or or you know effects work or or water or that type of stuff. Um, uh, that's, so that's un, something to consider. It's, uh, it's something that they didn't, generally don't get involved in. They generally don't get involved in animation as well. If you think about scripted cues that you might need in a scene. So what, what I generally do is I hobble the team together. I, I'll have a couple people from architectural visualization. I'll have a couple people from video games, a couple people from visual effects, and then we'll just all come together and where at, whenever somebody needs some help, the, the other person ha is strong in that in that aspect, whether that's programming or effects or animation, whatever the case may be, and that um, that helps. Uh, but I don't want to give the impression here that there is out there some silver bullet, some unreal person that you're going to find, and they're going to enable you to do everything. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist uh, right now. It's a little bit it's a little bit more like. Um, like hiring a boutique art director that does a specific type of like curtain or specific type of table or something like that, you're gonna end up having to hire a team of people who probably work together and each have different um, uh, disciplines. And those, those people are gonna come, to, come together and be capable of doing this task. As far as video games, um, it's actually quite similar, especially for those people who are making um, cinematic cutscenes in video games, the process to um, in, photo, in photorealism, in the creation of the materials, in the lighting, everything like camera movement, everything like that, uh, or camera, uh, sorry, placement, everything like that, um, that's gonna be pretty similar. The difference is for, uh, for cutscenes, they generally press render at the, at, the press, at the end of the process and they end up with a video file, whereas uh, we press play and then it starts a simulation, a real-time simulation of the scene. So that means that those um, those folks coming from video games sometimes don't uh, sometimes need a little bit of help understanding what is what looks good on an LED screen or in a green screen scene uh, to help sell the illusion. And that and that could be things like um, minimizing the specularity of elements, minimizing bloom removing full frame effects like chromatic aberration um, and that type of stuff, which are commonly things that people add to video game scenes because they want it to look gritty and real and, and everything like that. You don't need any of that uh, for XR specifically and oftentimes not for, for green screen as well. You wanna add that in post-production uh, afterwards. Um, uh, uh, so that's the consideration there, which means that Nobody, nobody coming from another industry is going to be a perfect fit every time. You're, get, you're going to have to put it, put, be creative there. Um, we have another question, uh, and it says, I may have missed it, but what are the comparative costs between a green screen and post production with VFX in comparison to the VR production like we see on The Mandalorian? Like mm. Man Mandalorian was done like five years ago where this technology wasn't available yet. Perfect. So this screen, uh, this slide will give you an example of the comparative cost from traditional to um, uh, um, LED XR backdrops. So we're, we're, we were talking about a 62 to 73% cost reduction. And that link there at the bottom, airwall.co, nightflyers cake study, that, you know, that's, that's a live link. You guys can go there and take a look at the full, it's about seven pages. A full case study that we did. Some of the stuff that's not on here um, um, is the time savings as well. Something that would normally take about three months, we were able to accomplish in three or four weeks. Um, uh, so actual like calendar time 
is also compressed as well. It's not just it's not just labor. It's not just like you're eliminating visual effects compositors and therefore you're saving on labor money. It's also the fact that everything that those visual effects compositors do, you know, that amazing, I used to be a visual effects compositor, that amazing light, you know, light shaping and getting the reflection in the, in the, in the uh, lens of the glasses and that's sort of, all that work that they do um, is done automatically by a, an algorithm in 41 milliseconds using this technology. And that, at the end of the day, that's one way to think about virtual production is that you're automating what was once uh, an intensive manual process and making that happen, you know, in 41 milliseconds, which is the time it takes for a 24 frame per second shutter to open and close. Um, so that's that's the comparison there. As far as um, the amount of people that it takes, it's also less. We're looking at a, uh, anywhere from a 25 to 75 percent reduction of the actual effects team as well. And that is because there is less to do. Uh, uh, there's a there's a more automated uh, a process happening, um, but it's also because it takes less time. So therefore there's um, less uh, overlapping uh, supervision uh, required for the project. Um, we're waiting for more questions to come up. Uh, I have another question. Um, so if you're a DP and you're shooting on, a, on the LED wall, what would you tell the DOP, like what you should definitely uh, do or not do, like for instance, fast movement with the camera or going for higher frame lights, like shooting at 48 frames, things like that. What is like advice to, to a DP that you can give them? Um, yeah, so my recommendation would be to uh, um, move the camera, uh, do not let the focal plane of the uh, camera fall on the screen. That's the biggest one. Because if you do so, you do get more A hits. Um, uh, even at distant, uh, even at distance, you sometimes get mixed uh, pixelation and more A hits. So the focal plane will want, you want to come off at least a few feet from the screen. And so that means that the screen should be slightly defocused, which is again, part of that is the distance that you're going to come off the screen. As far as moving it, we've, you know, we've been on, on warp cam, on jibs, on handheld. We've, you know, had people doing stunts, this, you know, doing like a, you know, like the Star Trek, um, you know, like we just got hit by a, a, a photon torpedo, like the fake um, uh, spaceship shake. We've done, have people do all of that, no problem. And uh, particularly on XR, on, on chroma key, um, if you do have fast action, you will want to uh, get the shutter speed faster so that you don't have as much motion blur because the motion blur, um, even in even in very very successful um, a king like uh, you know Star Wars movies, you will get a slight um, uh, artifact color artifact in your color aberration like grayness or purplishness or something like that. Um, so uh, as, uh, other than that, like I mentioned, global shutter is highly recommended. Um, let me think if there's anything else. Um, we we are have recently begun recommending interactive lighting. So this can come in a couple of ways. Uh, DMX protocol coming uh, through USB out of the Unreal Engine system can go into um, some smart lights and then basically sample a portion of the Unreal scene. So if you think of like sampling the sky, right? Then you have an LED panel, like an airy sky panel that is then delivering that hue, that luminance of sky. That can be very useful for driving scenes, for example, when you need to have a shift in the hue, uh, some kind of a sense of motion in the lighting. The other way to do that is uh, what people would saw on The Mandalorian, where you just have more screens, right? You've kind of like got screens on wheels, you've got wrapping around and everything like that. So you can actually drive that using LED systems as well. However, there's a caveat, which is that LED, LED lighting tends to not be full spectrum. It tends to have uh, three spikes that are uh, red, green, and blue. So um, uh, flesh tones can sometimes suffer. So you, in those instances, like they did in the Mandalorian and like we always do, you will want to supplement with uh, production lighting that is more full spectrum and 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 will give you nice flesh tones. If you don't have flesh tones in this in the scene, 
um, it's not as critical. So that's something to keep in mind. Like if everybody's wearing a helmet, you're doing a space, uh, a thing that like that, it's not as critical. Okay. Excellent. Um, yeah, we still have no further questions coming up. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's one more coming here. Um, okay. All right. Mar, Mar Molly, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so Mar Molly wants to know more about the computational requirements, not just the LED requirements, of course. Um, so uh, as far as the CPU, um, I mean, a lot of this is gonna be uh, a no-brainer. You just wanna use the fastest available on the market. So for on the CPU side, it's the AMD uh, Ryzen Threadripper series. Um, so we, we have those in all of our systems. I believe we use, we get the most expensive one. I don't know what it is. 9550x or probably something like that. Um, and then the uh, for GPU, if you are if you're not interested in Genlock and you're not interested in Sync, which not everybody is, um, then you're going to be good with one of the 30 series RTX cards, the um, the Nvidia RTX 3060 or 3080 or 3090, whatever uh, your flavor or or uh, budget. Um, and uh, if you are interested in uh, sync, you're going to want to bump up to the RTX Quadro series, also made by NVIDIA. And um, that is going to be, it costs a pretty penny. I'll be straight up with you. You will also need to get an add-on to that called the Quadro Sync 2 card so that you can uh, uh, genlock uh, to that. There are some instances, for example, when using a Novastar or Brompton processor on an LED screen, I'm getting very, I'm getting deep into the computational stuff, Marmali. But I hope you're happy. Um, uh, when you, when you, when, when you're connecting to a Novastar or Brompton LED process, basically the brain of the LED screen, you can sync to that Novastar or that Brompton, and sometimes get away with not using a Quadro sync card in your system. That is something that I realized less than a week ago. And we are doing R&D on that to figure that out. Just to give you an idea, this is like a totally, uh, this is happening very quickly. And we don't often get a lot of R&D time because we're like on productions and then not on the next production, everything like that. So we find out we might need less than we're, we're using. Um, so that's gonna be the consideration there. As far as uh, storage, uh, my recommendation is to go with the NVMe um, speed storage, which is going to be the highest available on the market. It's going to be that's going to make sure that your scenes load fast, that any textures uh, and uh, anything other uh, anything else in the scene loads very quickly, uh, so you don't get any sort of art loading artifacts or anything like that. Um, that also um, should help. Uh, in addition to the to the RAM, as far as far as RAM, I mean, it's just basically the fastest that you can possibly uh, get. The amount of RAM, uh, probably 16 um, or even 64 uh, would probably be the minimum that I would uh, put in. And um, okay, so as far as syncing machines together, um, which is what a lot of people have a question about, Unreal has a plugin called N Display, which allows you to basically spread the render load of the LED screens across multiple machines. So that, what that basically does is you will need to replicate the, the one machine multiple times. You'll need to either rent or purchase or build multiple versions of the machine. Each one can probably handle up to three screens. So in those instances where you have a large curved screen and a ceiling and then additional screens and everything like that, you may have situations where portions of the curve are being handled by a single system but then it's the entire system is spread across multiple systems. Using end display is not easy, and um, it's 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 uh, it requires actual uh, programming knowledge and technical and technical knowledge um, that may change soon. Uh, Unreal Engine is working a lot on that. It, it tends to be a difficult uh, uh, and complex process to set up, particularly since you will need to know the exact measurements of the curve of the screen and the position of the screen and everything like that. So there's a, it's, it's highly technical and it's high, it requires high level of physical accuracy, not just engineering, not just like software accuracy. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting hybrid process that's happening right now. So that's more, that's more information on that. If you wanna know more about the, comp, the way that the computation is done, there's definitely a lot of uh, documentation about end display. And uh, just to be clear, that's, that's uh, 
uppercase N and then the word display, all as one word uh, together. That's how that's spelled. Um, and that's something that's in Unreal Engine. And you can find out more about that. It uses a network protocol to do the syncing between multiple systems, which is something that isn't often used on set. So I personally don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> All right. Great questions. Really good questions. I think, uh, I think this is the end of the questions. Awesome. OK, so we're at 4.55. We did it, we went 55 uh, minutes uh, of me rambling on and on about the virtual production industry and you guys listening. So congratulations, we did it. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, right now, uh, I can give you uh, some final uh, tidbits. Um, some of the new uh, uh, interesting stuff that's happening in the industry is lens emulation. Basically kind of, kind of removing the physical lens mapping that goes into stuff and going fully digital it's the exciting stuff that is happening in, in the industry. If you wanna talk more about it, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, or you can email uh, the company at hello at airwall.co. I'm usually uh, happy to uh, talk to other filmmakers about this technology. So you're welcome uh, to reach out there. Uh, otherwise you can find out more information at arwall.co. Follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram or Twitter and, you'll, uh, or, and YouTube and you'll get uh, more updates uh, there. Uh, that's generally where we uh, get the word out. Um, we're gonna be making a big announcement later this month, so make sure you follow us and find out, find out uh, what the big announcement is is what's coming new in, uh, in virtual production. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Janelle and, uh, and Malachi, uh, for your kind comments. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Renee. That was very interesting and really informative. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you so much, Seth, and uh, and Marina, and everyone at Spark uh, CG for setting this up. I hope this was informative, guys. Uh, but it sounds like we got to call it there. Yeah.